so we need to as you see, okay? But you will have to... Oh. Eleven minutes moving down past the eight o'clock hour. Good evening, everyone. It feels so good to be back. <laughs> Welcome to the In the Spotlight Radio Show. We've had quite a long break following a COVID nineteen outbreak in Dominica. We had to resort to doing quite a few um, repeats of the program but good repeats repeat programs that the fans and listeners absolutely enjoyed thank you so much for your patience and understanding during the break of the in the spotlight radio show aired here on q95 radio on monday nights Thank you, Q95, for allowing uh, us the time to um, be back here in the studios. So thank you for that. Thank you to Mr. Greg Wall, and thank you to Showin for always being here to provide support to ensure that our show is uh, flawless and that we do not have any hitches when we begin our show. So thank you, Q95. Josephine Gabriel and the Company Limited, we thank you as well. We have our water uh, this evening to quench our thirst, so we do appreciate that. We thank our good friend, the GK of What's This, for always being willing to assist us with our video editing, um, whatever it is that we need support with. We thank Akim Lowe for assisting us with our flyers, our very beautiful and clean and neat flyers that he uh, produces for us. Thank you to you, the listeners and the fans of the program. It is always our pleasure to be here to serve you when we serve you through the airwaves of Q95 FM, but we also do so via our social media platforms. And we almost thought for a moment, you know, I almost called my guest and said, you know what? Social media is on total blackout. You cannot access WhatsApp, no Facebook, no Instagram. You know, what is going to happen to our fans who use these platforms to tune into the show? But I said, you know what? God is good. It's going to be back in time for when we're ready to start. And so it is. So good evening as well to our fans and friends who are utilizing our social media platforms. We are happy to have you. And we can be found via ITS Radio Show. It is a group by the In The Spotlight Radio Show. So you can look, you can join our group in the Spotlight Radio Show. So that's our fans group. Uh, I am Fidina Frampton. So you can follow me. You can follow as well my 
public page, which is for Daniel Fernando Frampton. We're on Instagram. And, um, you know, we just want you to do um, what you can. Our cash app is Spotlighters, dollar sign Spotlighters. So if you want to make a donation to us, we appreciate it. And we have other mediums as well that we can share. But we thank you. We thank those of you who donated for the t-shirt. So you made a donation and you received a, you received a t-shirt. Thank you so much for the support. Um, our friends have said that they're doing some more for us. So hopefully those who didn't get around to getting theirs, we will do so the next time around. Good evening again, wherever you are. And thank you for joining us for the return of the In the Spotlight radio show right here on Q95 FM radio and via our social media platforms. Our guest is Mervyn Delsol and Mervyn is here tonight to let us know that there is hope and there will always be hope and all you have to do is trust, believe and things can turn around for you. Keep it locked, we're coming right back with Mervyn Delsol, addiction, mental illness, and recovery rehabilitation. It is going to be quite a program, and we ask you to stay tuned and to remain locked with us for this program tonight. The In The Spotlight radio show is back. The fans were just reminding me that I had not yet sent the link. All right, so you now have the link. Those of you who are on WhatsApp, thank you, Jesus, it came back through for us uh, this evening. So those of you who are tuned in, um, you, you, you can now find the, uh, the link via WhatsApp as well. And I'm just ensuring that this is shared 
to our various platforms as well because I think tonight's story is one where, you know, um, as many people as possible should be able to access this program and to hear from this gentleman on the program here tonight. So we thank all of you again and we do appreciate you and um, we're almost ready to get going with the In The Spotlight radio show tonight. All right, keep it locked. Yeah. Oh, put it high. <laughs> and here we are. 8.20 is the time in the studios of Q95 FM Radio. And we say good evening to our guest, Mervyn Delsol. Good evening to you for that. Good evening to you. How are you? I'm fine. I'm doing fine. Just great. You're doing just great. I like the hair, Wilby. I like the hair. I like it too. I like the hair. I like the hair. Um, Mervyn, I, I have to acknowledge a group. Um, they're called Echo 78. And Echo 78 are actually responsible for you being on with me um, tonight. And I just want to share a bit um, with you all about um, ECHO 78 and their mission is to empower youth globally through life enrichment and climate resilient based projects. Their vision is to motivate and inspire young people to participate in development activities in order to maximize their full potential in the era of global climate change awareness, growth, and productivity. Their targeted group, Equus 78, primarily focuses on the youth. Hence, the organization is developing specific strategies to connect with young people in their various locations and devise the best programs to appropriately engage them to meet their specific needs. So thank you so much, Echo 78. They reached out to me um, some time ago and I said, you know what? This would be an awesome guest for the return of the In The Spotlight radio show. And here we are tonight. So thank you, Echo 78. And I will give special mention to Julie Martin. Thank you, Julie, you're an awesome young lady. And I look forward to having you as well um, on the program next week when we focus on online schooling and, and, and everything related to education. Um, we still have some good programs to come. We are already booked for the month of October, so we are all set to go. And we're starting off with this incredible guest. I, I think this guy is a hero. I think he's an awesome guy and he's going to share with us this evening. We're going to begin, ladies and gentlemen, please. Um, what we want from you right now is just to relax and listen, and then we talk. Over to you, Mervyn. Anyone who become addicted to drugs, 100% of the time have a level of pain that they are dealing with. I dropped out of school at an early age, about 14 years old, I will say. For a few months, with nothing to do, I wandered the streets of Rosalind till I was certain as to what I wanted to do. Then I went to my father and told him I found out what I wanted to do. I said to him, I want to go to music school. I want to be a musician. He said, OK. Then I was enrolled at the Christian Music School. There I studied the double bass. A few months later, Daryl Ball approached me to join his band called Youngsters. I said yes. At the first band practice session, I asked the band members, are you going to be doing this all only when you're, you're young? After a while, we collectively decided 
to Chinton Lee. And this was the beginning of the Rough and Ready Band. A few years later, I got introduced to Ken Robinson because we decided to do an album at his recording studio, Nature Island Recording Studio. After completing the album, Ken Robinson asked me to be the music composer for, Nature, for the Nature Island Recording Studio because we had developed such a really good working relationship. Whilst there, I got the opportunity to study audio engineering. About two years later, my band, the Rock and Ready Band, made a song called Ring Ting Ting, which quickly became a popular, a popular hit song, especially in Guadeloupe and Martinique. Instantly, my workload had, and that of the band had, had been multiplied greatly. I was always performing locally, always on tour, and I was always at the recording studio. This went on for years to the point where I outgrew Nature Island Recording Studio. So I had to invest in a new state-of-the-art recording studio, which cost me $90,000. And again, my workload multiplied greatly. Producing, arranging, and composing two to three albums a month without neglecting my other commitments. After years of, of that routine, it is sad to say, but my passion had consumed me. I was physically and mentally burned out. There was pain in every part of my body. Chain smoking is when someone uses a cigarette that is almost finished to light up a new one. I use marijuana extensively. In my case, I would chain smoke marijuana cigarettes all day and all night, in excess of $500 worth every week, which led to my drug addiction. Marijuana brought about a negative change in me. I became very hasty and antisocial, gradually withdrew myself from friends and family, which led to me being isolated in this big empty house with only my addiction. This effect that marijuana had on me wasn't a positive one. Guns, knives, gangster rap were the kind of things that I found comforting to me. I didn't like that about myself. I didn't like what I had become. So after about two years of that lifestyle, I decided to break my drug addiction I simply humble myself and use less and less until there was no need to smoke. About a year and a half later, I got introduced to crack. Crack is a drug that is made out of cocaine. Unlike marijuana, crack had an opposite effect on me. After use, this drug had allowed me to experience this huge, peaceful, and tranquil presence in and around my entire body, but lasts only about five minutes. As the years went by, literally nothing else mattered besides feeling myself with this peaceful feeling. One night about 11.30, on Independence Street. I was going through the garbage, compiling things that were edible to have for supper, and then to find a good sidewalk that I could sleep on, like I normally do every night. While going, while going through one of the, the bins by the free dollar store, I heard someone shout, Boy, come out in that! Then he approached me, and grabbed my bag of food and threw it onto the middle of the street. Without saying anything, I went and picked up my bag. But that seemed to anger the fella even more. He ran to his vehicle and came back with a cutlass. I started walking backward in the middle of the street, moving toward the East Low Black Bridge. When I reached at the crossroad, that's on Kennedy Avenue and Independent Street, I stopped, hoping that he would back down, but he didn't. There, 
he made his first attack. The impact, that impact on top of my head. Now I'm standing there, there thinking, he hit me with the side of the cutlass. Then I felt this cold liquid running down my forehead. When I checked, it was blood. Now I'm having mixed feelings because I am angry, baffled, peaceful, and furious all at the same time. I then shout, partner, you just caught me. Before I could finish, he attacked again. This time I raised my left hand in defense, but my little finger got cut off. My ring finger got cut, only hanging by its skin. I, quick, I quickly turned and ran away while being chased by him. I found refuge at Charles' grocery shop. Yet, all these things happened in just a split second. The police task force was out, make, out making the usual rounds, and while passing by, they saw me outside Charles' grocery shop, all drenched in blood. They took me to the Princess Margaret Hospital, and there I was cared for. After two weeks, I got discharged from the hospital. Two days later, I got a small project to do to scrape off paint on a house on Great George Street. While on the project, I got a bit tired, so I took a break and went on my way to buy some drugs. When I reached on Independent Street, a friend gave me $20. After I took about two steps, then changing my mind about buying drugs. I did a right about turn and was on my way back to complete my project on Great George Street. But was stopped suddenly at that very same crossroad, Kennedy Avenue and Independent Street. But this time it was the Princess Margaret Hospital's mental health unit. They were looking for me to get me off the streets. They took me and I was admitted. After about a week and a half, I escaped from the hospital and that was without bearing in mind that I had a very serious injury. Two days after I escaped, I went back to the hospital to attend to my injury, but I was detained and I was readmitted. From this point, I then humbled myself and allowed the process of change to happen. One of my cousins, Julia Green, whom is a, uh, a certified nurse in the United States, came down to Dominica on behalf of my family and relatives overseas to coordinate my rehabilitation process. My answer for any and everything positive was yes. Mervyn, do you want to stop using drugs? Yes. Mervyn, do you want to go to rehab? Yes. And this is how I got rehabilitated. By actually believing this is what I really want for myself. It's 33 is the time in the studios here at Q95 FM radio. I know by now many of you must be in tears. When I first read it, I tear. I know many of you must be having different thoughts. Did he go through all of this? What happened? What caused it? You heard him reference humility a couple of times. Him saying, I humbled myself. Even in that frame of mind, and under the influence of whether it was marijuana or cocaine, he was still able to find that level of humility in his efforts to make the decision to help himself. Tonight, we're going to speak to Mervyn about the various elements that he spoke to in his story. Mervyn, I know what you shared with us 
is probably just the tip of the iceberg in terms of your story. And I'm happy that you put this together to lay the foundation for our conversation tonight um, on the program. I think you're very brave and I want to thank you for your bravery. Why did you decide to do this tonight, Bowden, to come and to share with us your story? Well, I believe that being a public figure, someone which is kind of inevitable, I can only run from interviews for so long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thank you for choosing me to share your story with. And, um, you know, we have radio listeners, we have viewers on Facebook, we have many people who are listening to you tonight. And I know at the end of it all, Mervyn, your story, if your story inspires at least one person, then we would have done a good job here tonight. We're going to start off with getting to know a little bit more about you before we get into the story. So tell us, Mervyn Delso, who's your family? Where are you from? Mervyn Delso, okay. Mervyn Delso is the first offspring of Davina Samuel, aka Ingrid, and Andre Delso, aka Sheriff from Fokoya. Okay. Are they still alive? My mother is alive and she's living the life of a street person oh. yes and that that's 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 the life that's the life she's living and that's the life the kind of life i grew up with she have always been that way actually um we relate as normal and this is how i know her but i was raised by my um my my aunt and my great-grandmother they were my, my, my caretakers and stuff. My, how do you call it? Uh, Adoption. My guardians. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, Before you, you go further, moving, mm -hmm. um, have you tried to help your mom or have others tried to help her to get off the streets? Of course, yes. She has, she is labeled as a chronic drug addict. Okay. A chronic mental ill person as well cannot kill. This is just how she should be. And this is just how it is. Yeah. And do you have siblings? Yes, I have. Um, I have a, three sisters. I have three brothers. Oh, I have two brothers and me. Yes, yeah. two brothers, three sisters. Mm -hmm. Um, I am the first born of both of my parents. My my father, Andrew Delso, was quite um, a popular person in Fukuoka. Um, he was a trucker, mm. and uh, I also see him as the, the first representation of a hero. So he was kind of my my hero, my hero. How so? Uh, he was just that person that was standing tall and had that stern voice and driving a big truck and, okay. and, and you know, always serious. Yeah, so he, he I, I, as well as the, the entire um, community of football, he looked up to him. He was that kind of person that, that leader. He was, he was the leadership type. He was the leadership type of person. Is he still with us? No, he's, he's, he's gone. He's, he's deceased. He's sleeping with uh, the angels. He's sleeping with the angels, <laughs> yes. So you mentioned Fongoli, but what, what area, where, where did you grow up? Fongoli, me, I was, I was, I was um, raised at Two Way Good River. That's where I was, I grew up. With your between, aunt? With my great-grandmother. Okay. And it was between my great-grandmother and my aunt, who, who, who lived at Kingsley, Upper Kingsley. So I was going back and forth, back and forth. Yeah, this, this is this is what this was the the figures that I knew of as role models. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was life like? What did they teach you? 
business. My great grandmother was really um, a person that everything for her was about business. Um, actually, my 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 first set of toys that I had was pennies and pennies. Um, these were the things that I played with because she used to sell ice pop and coconut cheese and this thing. And there was the um, the Seventh Day Adventist School right next to them, so. We was the one supplying the snacks and stuff like that, you know. So the, the kids would come through the window, and then, and it, that that taught me a, a, gave me a sense of, of, of business principle and stuff. So I kind of grew up in that with that mentality, that business mentality. And um, this is what she did for me. This yes. is what she did for yeah. you. So you 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 had you picked up a certain level of business acumen from your your grandma. My great grandmother. Your great grandmother. Yes. 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 And, and what else, Mummy, do you remember about growing up as a little boy, as a young man? Oh, well, I was. What type of person were you? Did you play around with friends? What was it like? I am kind of identical to how I was when I was young. Quiet, Quiet. cool, collective. reserved. Yes. Well mannered and stuff. That, that, I've always been that way. You were a well-mannered young man. Yes. <laughs> well, when you grow up with, with grandparents and great-grandparents, you know, that's what happens, you know. Yes. They teach you that. They teach you manners. You have to say good morning to Ma Teresa. You have to say hello. You cannot pass and not greet somebody on the road and that kind of thing. So I, I suspect that is what you, you, you grew up with, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a young man. I was a child that was continually smiled with love oh. and affection. And I guess even up to today, if I don't get a level of that, <laughs> I guess uh, I cry like a baby. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that you are still getting some of that, so you don't yeah. have to cry like a baby. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is why I mentioned in um, one of the passages that after using um, marijuana, mm -hmm. The change was as vivid as night and day, mm -hmm. and so different. I didn't like what I've become because mm -hmm. that wasn't the kind of person I'm, I really am. Mm -hmm. And to see that the that, that sort the substance the, the, that drug had such influence on my character, I didn't like that. Mm -hmm. you, you you say at the beginning of your of your comments. Anyone who becomes addicted to drugs, 100% of the time, have a level of pain that they're dealing with. Explain that to us. Man. This, this is um, what that what pain is. What really people um, that use drugs, people use drugs to get away from pain or to give them a a recess. So that they can continue functioning or dealing with whatever they are dealing with, um, and because of because this is something that you have to keep giving yourself continually. That's how you become addicted. Mm -hmm. But it always starts with some level of pain that you're trying to get recess from be it emotional or physical it always starts with pain and then you use drugs you get a moment and then you go back to your painful self and then you want more and then you need another break you need another recess and then you keep increasing your recesses and increases them Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and then when you do when you do drugs too much, it's obvious you're going to become addicted. Mm -hmm. It's gonna mess with your hair too. Yeah. We're gonna talk more about that, Melvin. Um, but let's talk about school days a bit. You're saying there that you dropped out of school at an early age. What led to that, and what school did you drop out of? I do, I do not want to say it is a bad thing or, or good. When I first get my
Okay, just bring it a bit closer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if we want to say it's a bad thing or a good thing. Mm -hmm. But the introduction of VH1 and MTV that blew my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that blew my mind. Um, after seeing these people on TV singing and all this music and all these things happening and I'm getting a visual representation of that blow that literally blew my mind mm -hmm. and after that I just couldn't I just couldn't do anything in school you couldn't focus on school no I, I just because that had just taken me off from one point <laughs> and it was like a quantum leap it's like I mean, all these things was happening. All these things are happening because we wasn't exposed to to those things. VH1 and MTV had just hit because due to um, I think it was I'm not sure if it was mapping or, or antenna, but mm -hmm. anyway, it was on the television and then it had a great influence, had a great impact on me, and I I couldn't but what, but see what? myself doing anything. In school, I just wanted to do that. You wanted to do what they were doing on, on TV. TV, on MTV. Yes, on I just wanted to do that. But did you think that school was a way to getting you to doing that? That would have been the best decision for me to make. Uh -huh. <laughs> but as a child, as a, uh, I, I, I didn't have that foresight, and. Uh, I just wanted to do that. I didn't want to do school again. I just couldn't school. What school? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, what school were you attending? I, I was. I went to um, my first school. I attended was a school on um, on Guru Road mm -hmm. called Happy Day School. Okay, <laughs> and then. That was that was like um, that was like the, the, the preschool, and then my second school was Seventh Day Adventist. Mm -hmm. and then my first school, third school was was a um, Goodwill School. Then I was I went to SMP Saint Mary's Primary, and then from there I didn't I didn't make it common become common entrance, uh, so I had to go to Rosa Boy School. Mm -hmm. And then I dropped off after. That's work. when you dropped. I dropped off. Dropped yeah. off. But but I, I want to understand, uh, Mervyn. So when you saw what they were doing on television, right, and you mm -hmm. say that's what you want to do, how did you think that you were going to get to do what they were the, doing? The thing is that I I I I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. I was just it it had just blew my mind. And then school. Doesn't look like that. Uh -huh. Putting them ne next to each other, it, it, and then it's like you know you go you 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 you're always in, I'm not playing a mister I play mister. That's right. So, so, <laughs> so uh, it, uh, it was something like that for me. It was something like that. Yeah, for yeah. You. So I just push school aside, education aside. But I wouldn't want to say push education aside because after a while I realized that I wanted to go to music school. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, before, after you dropped out of school, what did you do? I just wandered in Rosewood. I would guess I was, I would be considered as a dweeber S. Mm -hmm. Always dweeber Just trying to find, find what I wanted to do. So that, and that, maybe that was, one, maybe one of the best things that happened to me. I dropped out of school and then I logged in myself some time to find out what I, exactly what I wanted to do and how I'm going to achieve it. And did you do that? Did you find that? I, fi I, fi I found out what I wanted to do and then I reported to my father and I told him that I found, I found out what I wanted to do and I want to go to music school and I want to be a musician. Mm -hmm. So I was certain at that point what I wanted to do and then I went to him and he say okay I and mean, then he supported me so he assisted you in going to music school yes he paid he's the one that, that enrolled me he's the one that paid for it 
and everything so but but that still brings us back to the mtvs and the vh1 they i'm sure what you were looking at because mm. it's music yeah, people music, singing yeah, music videos, videos yeah. and all of that <laughs> So I'm sure that that also influenced your decision, did it? Well, did yes, well, yes, but yes, but I I couldn't put it into into context. I couldn't put it into into words. I couldn't put it into my reality until I took time out and and search and allow myself to answer me as to what and how. To achieve it. Mm -hmm. So your dad assisted you, and you went to music school. Which music school did you go to? I went to. Uh, at the time, there was only one. There was Christian music school. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the um, school that was um, devoted to music, music education. Mm -hmm. How old were you at the time? I about about fourteen, fifteen. By by fifteen years, I was already playing music. Mm -hmm. Since so, so it's fourteen years, going into fifteen years. Yeah. So you went to Christian music school, and what um, instruments did you learn to play? At? I, I know I tell you, when I when I when I went in to to be enrolled and stuff like that. So now, when I look around in the room, I mean I, I can't play an instrument. Yeah, you I couldn't at the time. No, no, I I, I never mean, I touch an instrument. <laughs> anyway, so. I look around in the room and I look for the most intimidating instrument and it ended up being the double bass. The double bass is the big, big violin. <laughs> That's what I choose. And that was very, very difficult. After a while, I just give up. You gave up on it? I gave up. Yeah, I said, I'm not doing this again. I don't know. And then I, I, I went, I continued doing regular bass. Okay. okay. <laughs> I continue the regular bass because that that was that's too much. That's and the school provided the instruments. Yes. The school provided yeah. the instruments. So when you were coming into the school there's a whole set of instruments. All kind of instruments. You know? All kind of instruments instruments I've never seen before. That they are there and and whatever instrument you want to you want to, to learn, Mr Christian would be there, Mr Christian Senior would be there. To assist, he was the the music teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you settled on the regular bass. The regular Tell bass. us what the regular bass is. Well, the regular bass is, is what we know today as a bass instrument. It has four strings. The, the strings is about a quarter of an inch. Um, it's it is the one that, that plays the low frequencies of the music. Yes. It has something like the boom boom boom. That's a bit like that. It's so okay. This guitar mm -hmm. is, uh, so you and you stuck to that. I stuck. I stuck. Did you did you attempt any other instrument? Well, I I, I know how to play guitar. I know how to play keyboard. I can do a little thing on the trumpet. No, nothing to brag about. Um, yeah. So. And all I, of that at the music school, or eventually, eventually on your own? Eventually on my own. Eventually on my own. I mean, I am always learning. Even when I was going through my um, my addiction process, I was continually paying attention to my behaviors and the influences and how it made me feel and taking note like a scientist. <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of person I am. Mm -hmm. Yes. And and how long did you stay at music school? Um, I stayed there, uh, say about. Uh, say about about two years. Yeah, about two years. Because when I stopped, I stopped, and then after joining the band, well, becoming part of Rough and Ready, I encouraged the entire band to go to music school. So all of us was going to music school for a while, and then things became so hectic that we couldn't continue because because of our schedule. Mm -hmm. Alright. Yeah. So so music is what Melvin was going to do. Yeah, yeah. Nothing else. Nothing else. Nothing else. Forget about school, forget about all of that. But you wanted to be a musician yeah. and focusing on the bass guitar. Yeah. And and you learned it well enough 
I would presume from Christian school. Yes. yes. You left there a guitarist, a bass guitarist well, yes. when you when you left. Mm -hmm. What what would become of you as far as music is concerned from where you live? Say that again, I didn't What know. would what would become of you from mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. In other words, what did you do with that music that you learned at, at Christian music school? Well, I learned how to um the thing I believe is that music is, is part of all of us. What we what we use music for is a, is a, a, a kind of discipline to to express the thing, the, 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 the songs or the thing that you the feeling that you have inside to 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 to, um, to express yourself. Transmit this information outward. We use music and instruments to do that. But um I believe I learned a lot of things to empower me, to, to give me the, the flexibility to be able to express my inner feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's what I learned from um, music school. Yes. And also, mm -hmm. after I stopped at Christian Music School, I also employ Freddie Nicholas to tutor me as well. So I in what area? Bass, bass, bass guitar. Bass guitar. Yeah, so I, I continue. So you want to continue learning? Yeah I continue learning because um Freddie was um teaching some uh, a different level from Christian. So that was a uh, another um, added feature to my the style, the way that I played my arm and bass guitar because of the, the, the influences of my teachers. Yeah. You have a, a bit of a different style? Well, yes. Yeah. Okay, fine. You would have then joined the band upon the request of a dear friend. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, while I was in music school, um, Daryl Bob approached me and tell me he needed a bass man. Would I like to be part of the band? And he had a band called he, Abdari Bob, Fixture Mills, Cohen Hazel, mm -hmm. and Clayton Geist. Mm -hmm. They all were part of a band called Youngsters. Mm -hmm. And then, so I told him, yes, I will be part of the band. I'll join. So after, at, at the first practice, At the first practice, practice um, I asked the, 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 the question, are you guys going to be doing this only when you're young? Because their name was Youngster. <laughs> <laughs> so after what we, they, we think about it and stuff like that, we all decided to change the name from Youngster to Rough and Ready. Okay. And that was the, the, the book. Of Rupert. This is how I became uh, a founding member of Rough and Ray because Rough and Ray didn't exist before me. Mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. so it was a technicality actually, but <laughs> this is how this is how it played out. Tell me about first of all, I, I want you to know that Daryl Bob um, is someone who cares deeply, very deeply about you. Um, he sees you being more than a brother to him. Um, in fact, I thought you were cousins, but <laughs> I was told no. Um, but he, he seemed to have stood there with you through happy times and through sad times the best he could as well. Yes. Tell me about your friendship or your, your, your relationship with Daryl Bob. Well, um, Daryl Bob and I, we went to Sydney at the school together. We knew each other from, from way back because we we were kind of neighbors. Um, I'll in I would sum up the friendship with, with Darrow and I. We uh, really, as you put it, we are more than brothers. It's like that is that is both that's looking at that is that is that is there, and that's how they are. We 
For all the years we've been together playing music, say about 20 years, we never once had a disagreement. Are you kidding? We never once had a disagreement. And he, he is kind of holding that. He holding his, he holding that at heart because he was saying that maybe that's the reason one of the reasons why I started taking drugs because we never argue. Right, maybe. We never get things off our chest. We never <laughs> But it's it, it's all, it was deeper than that. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And it's good that people can have that level of friendship with mm him. -hmm. Tell me about the band and, and what it was like being a member of Rough and Ready and some of your achievements and some of the things you did, some of the contributions that you made to the band. Well, it was, the band is, um, I, when you people say band, I, it's just, that's the, the, the members of the band are just family. Even mm -hmm. though we are not playing together, we, we socialize like that. We would have band practice and then we would put food together, go by the river, have a picnic. And that's the kind of things we used, we used to do. And we used to do that among ourselves. This was more, this is more like a brotherhood. Um, my, my influence in the band and my, the weight that I carry, for, um, I would, let, me, let me say this first. The first recording that we had to do, as you're rough and ready, the keyboardist, Koam, Cohen, Cohen is, uh, and Fixture emails, they were both co and keyboardists. Cohen had to go to, to America to do some of our business, to do some bring and business. So he didn't get a chance to, to record, and then I had to fall in, fill in it. And now I had two responsibilities. I had to be doing the, um, the keyboards and, and, the bass. And, the, and the bass and then the drummer had to go he got the opportunity to go on ship and then and it was like that so and then it ended up being only Daryl Bob and I after a while and then if we needed additional musicians we would hire them so I the original well, rough and ready is moving on bass but the Daryl Bob and moving rough and ready is moving on keyboard Okay. Down on guitar. So you again. transition to keyboard. Yeah. Forcefully. And, forcefully. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but the, it allowed me to be more flexible in the recording studio because the keyboard has a wider range of um, accompaniments than any other instrument. You can take a keyboard and play drums, you can take a keyboard and do, play flute, brass, all kinds of things. And as a music producer, it encouraged me to learn more and more how to express myself on the instrument. Tell me about some of the things that you were able to accomplish with the band. So, for example, I was told that you basically mastered the, the, the Christmas album for Rough and Ready. Tell me about that and some of the other contributions that you made um, to the band. The Christmas album, Rough and Ready Sunshine um, album, in one was a, a unique album, and um, I believe it became a hit, not just because of its um, the musical attributes. I believe it became a hit because of the um, the people that was behind it at the time. So, Ken Robinson. Wadix, Rudy J, and Rough and Ready. We all we came together to do this album. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, Wadix and, and Rudy J doing promotion. And we had Ken Robinson being the executive producer. Mm -hmm. And then you had Rough and Ready to supply the music. And you are moving there so as a producer, and it was quite a challenge for me because this is something that I had to do in about a week or two. Well, I believe it's, it's one week. I had to do, do the music and do the music because of we have to fight, get do it and send it to um, Miami so they can send it back so it could be in Dominica in time for for Christmas. And that was 
we was already behind time, so I had to do this album in one week. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. Let's take a little of it. says that um, all he came with was his voice, <coughs> sorry, and his guitar, and you did practically everything else. Well, yes, um, that's, uh, actually, this album was recorded at, when we were at, um, when I was at um, Nature Island Recording Studio, and at the time I was the music composer for the recording studio. So that's what co music composers do, they compose music, mm -hmm. put music together. Mm -hmm. And that's so what that's brilliant doing. moving. <laughs> that's really brilliant work that you did. The, well, after you completed what, what, that, what that blows my mind about yes. the is the, the space of time that I did. Mm -hmm, the one week. Yeah. And it never grows old. Never grows old. It <laughs> never grows old moving. It never grows old. Every every year Christmas comes around. This album is all always sounds like a freshly released album. Great work on that. Great work on that movie. Yes, yes. How did you feel after you had completed that and you heard that? I mean, just listening to it in the studio and then hearing it on the radio. How did you feel about that? Honestly, for Diana, I haven't gotten a chance to absorb none of my work as yet. To actually sit down and bask in its ambience. I haven't done that yet. I am still feeling the effects of of what happened, how I overworked myself, and even today, even mommy, today, even today, yeah, even today. but uh, you, you know, it might be some therapy to just do that though, to listen, to just play your music in a room and listen to the work you've done and you know the the, the amazingly beautiful work that you done that you've done. <laughs> I'm sure it might give you a real nice nostalgic feeling. You must do it sometime. Yes. <laughs> what other work did, did you do with Rough and Ready? Some of the work that we know. Um, you mentioned Ting Ting. Well, all Rough and Ready albums have the, the composer. You're the composer. Yeah, all Rough and Ready albums. Yes. You, yeah. you, you knew that's what you wanted to do when you dropped out of school. <laughs> no question about no, that. No, at the time I dropped out, I didn't, you know. didn't know. I just know that school wasn't happening for me. Just basic school wasn't happening for me. And... Uh, yeah, that's why I wandered the streets of Rosu mm -hmm. with nothing to do okay. until I find something that I yes, want to do. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you worked on a cruise ship for some time. <laughs> yeah, I did. After, after, um, after I, I, my passion had consumed me, I overworked myself. Mm -hmm. I, I thought the ship would have been. Uh, some form of, of um, therapy, some, but it, it only frustrated me mm -hmm. more to be in this um, closed space, and then I just I, everything was just a hundred times more difficult. Mm -hmm. I mean, things that would have been easier I mean, on the ship, on the ship, you, you don't pay for anything. You play, you play from like you play from twelve to two o'clock. And maybe when the ship is leaving, and then you go back, and you as a musician, you can go anywhere you want on the ship. And I, 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 I was just, I was a little too mad, mm -hmm. basically. And then, even at that time, well, yes, yeah, I was a little mad. When you went to work on the cruise ship, yes. So that had started mm -hmm. before. Yes, well, yes. Oh, I thought that was something that happened after you came back from all of that. No, 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 no. 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 So how did you work that out, working on a cruise ship? 
Well, I, I, I you use, found your way. I use, I use drugs. I use, I smoke marijuana. I, I, I How did you get fraternize with the guests, and they bring, they give, they, they will bring me, they give it to me. You know, I um, go sometimes in Mexico and get stuff. Maybe, and, 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 and you would have had to smuggle it onto the ship because oh, you yeah, would not have been allowed to bring that on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And Addict finds a way. Um, well, that's it. Addict finds a way yeah. to make it happen. You ever got caught? No, I, the, the only, the only um, thing that ever happened to me was I ended up um, going, I think it was um, Bahamas. I think I end up going and smoke. I end up on a beach with, with a friend of mine. And then I I was late for the ship, so the ship had to wait for me. And then, and then um, I got a, a warning. So I, I kind of make up for it. I, I did a, a free show on, on like Tom Susan Casino. Mm -hmm. To, to kind of make up for put myself back in a good mood, so I would play upstairs and by the pool, you know, the um, open area, and then from there I would go downstairs in the casino and have my own show, one man show, singing and stuff like that. I did that for uh, a couple of weeks, and then to so make up, to make up, yeah, gratis. The drugs did that to you. It's unfortunate, yeah. yeah. It's, it's gone, but you've learned from all of that. In terms of the cruise ship, though, um, why did you end your time on there? I, how did it end? How did it end? I just, I ended my, my contract was up and then I just didn't renew it. I didn't want to, to, um, I didn't want to be on ship because I was an addict. Mm -hmm. You, you, you found it it, it, it it challenged you. You felt that you were challenged in getting it when you wanted it. No, I just began, I feel, yes, I, I feel, well, eventually, if I am share, eventually, they will deport me. They will send me back down. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that's what I would happen. Because all the rules you were saying, you're not, you're not supposed, things you're not supposed to do, yeah. I was doing. Yeah. I, and at the end of my contract, I, I just said, you know something, it's pointless going and pretend to myself that I am not going to get caught. Mm -hmm. Because once you break in the law, eventually you will be caught. Correct. Yeah. How did it start? Mm -hmm. The addiction of marijuana yes. started um, due to overworking myself. In the recording studio, working myself. It generally in music. Um, I use. I started using marijuana as a way of to relax myself, so that I can continue doing more. Uh, relax. I can continue doing more to allow me some breathing space. And then, um, I guess I wanted the, too much breathing space, and mm -hmm. then I, I had to. But oh, why? But yeah. why marijuana? Why? How did marijuana. you get around to it? Marijuana was always, it's all everywhere and anywhere. Mm -hmm. Marijuana is. Did somebody introduce you to it, or did you introduce yourself to it? Well, I was. I first got my first ever taste of marijuana. I was. I was very young. I was about maybe eight years, seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. My mother gave me a pool. Ah. Yeah, so but this is, is during the years it was not it wasn't something that I I mean it was always marijuana was always around in my presence, but I would it's not something that I grew up partaking in. Mm -hmm. That wasn't me. You know, and then after I mean all the morning, all the pain, all the I had a quick life and then it just seemed, it just seemed, well, it's there, let me try it, and then, okay, I, I can like that, I mean, that's the energy that is going around, you know, everything is hyped, and then, and that's what marijuana makes, that's the, 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 um, the feeling that it brings to me, it makes me, oh, 
you know, always pump and always love to some people it makes them relax. And that's so that's what I was about yeah. to say to you. To me, it does it have different different impacts on different, different people. people. Yes, yes. So that's because I know some people it makes them calm yeah, and cool all, and yeah. so on. But you say it did the opposite, the opposite to you. Yeah. 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 If I smoke I could I smoke a marijuana right now. Mm -hmm. I just changed from it from night to day. Yeah, night to day. Yeah. From man to beast. Yeah, and they say. <laughs> yeah. Well, but what would it cause you? How would it cause you to behave? So is it that you would probably just I would probably say the wrong thing to you when you get upset? And you would I was what, always what? mad at everything. You was always I'm always mad at I always edgy, always. Mm -hmm to rough and so that, that's just that's just the kind of person that the kind of movie that that if you want like you want a, a, a grumpy mm -hmm. even a marijuana mm -hmm. you'll get a, a true grumpy person mm -hmm. did you did you smoke the the, the, the the core thing the real thing the, the I know sometimes it's mixed with other no, things no no I always I never mix marijuana with cigarettes or anything just pure marijuana. You just smoke the pure yeah, marijuana. Yeah, high grades. High grade. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get physical as a result of you know the, 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 the rage and the, the anger that it would bring out in you? Uh, of course. You fought that's, with people? Did you ever? Yes, I mean, that's, that was. That's 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 that is that kind of a life. But most time, the, the, the gangster life that you see people portray. Mm -hmm. That is what that is that is the image that marijuana brings out. That image is true. It's real. It's real. <laughs> you want guns, you want knives, you want gangster rap, you want to be that is marijuana. And that if I spoke that that is what I become. That's what you became. So I didn't like that. I didn't like that. People in um, the, the, my family and friends didn't like that movie. Mervyn didn't like that movie. Mm -hmm. You understand? So I mean, How long did you smoke um, marijuana? I, I, I do marijuana for about two years. So two years? Two, three, yeah, two, three years. Yeah. Two, three years. What, what happened to you within that time, that two, three years that you smoked with? How did your life transform? What happened to you? Well, I, I, I push everybody who was around me away so that I could have more time to be by myself so I could smoke. So you enjoyed your own company yes. at that time? Um, I just I just didn't want to hear people talking in my head, mm -hmm. stop you always smoking but you I just just push everybody away. I found I found ways to make everybody that was around me depart, leave. And um, that is the reality. That marijuana that really puts me in, in uh, give me that that negative attribute. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really, I don't really like, I don't really like that. That's not moving like moving as a baby. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, that's not. Me. And I see moving now. All I remember myself as. As a baby, as a young child, how I remember myself, and that is who I know as well. Not that person you became. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Within that time, were you already on the streets? No, I, I, I will. I, I, I went after, after I started smoking crack. Mm -hmm. when, you know, nothing else mattered at that mm -hmm. point besides getting that inner peace, getting that tranquil space, and mm -hmm. it's just you. Alone in the universe, mm -hmm. it lasts five minutes, and you go, you hustle money to get back to take another. So we're talking about crack. Now. That's crack. Okay, let's 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 get let's 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 get over marijuana first. <laughs> okay. So you did marijuana for about two or three years, and then you decided on your own mm -hmm. that you were going to stop. Yes, yes. Tell us about that that journey, that aspect of it. How did you get to that? It wasn't that hard. I mean, that it was not. You know, the hard part was actually deciding to to stop. After I said, well, when I decided, well, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop smoking. 
I decided to myself and then I was convinced that I, I, won, I was going to stop. Then I just willfully aim on smoking less and mm -hmm. less. As you see, I win myself from mm -hmm. marijuana, smoke less and less. You did it on your own? Yeah. And yeah. the strategy you used was that you were going, you, you were smoking five joints. But on average, how much would you have smoked one day? On average? A day. Whole day. Whole day. Chain smoke whole day, honestly. And, and explain to us what chain smoking chain is smoke again? Chain smoking is when you, you use a, cig a, a cigarette that is almost finished. Mm -hmm. So instead you throw it away, you use it and you light a new one and you continue smoking. It's like a really, you just wow. continue going. So five, six, seven joints a day? <laughs> I don't know how much it would take to, to fill um, 48 hours wow. or 24 hours. Moving. I cannot even remember myself where the point where I saw like, to sleep. I mean, I was like always smoking and always in the studio. Yeah. So all of that time, you were okay um, in terms of um, mental, okay. somewhat. I, it's impossible for me to be okay at that time doing what I was doing. <laughs> that wasn't. That's not. That's not. Uh, mm -hmm. That's that's that was too much. So, so you, you 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 got off the marijuana. Yeah. And then how long did you stay before you moved on to the next level? Yeah, about a year and a half. About a year yeah, and a half. You were fine. Yeah, I see. You were it's good. Clean, yeah, clean you were color, clean. Yeah. By the way, I just didn't want to see anything way. about marijuana. I just didn't want to see that. But by the way, I should tell you, somebody um, sent me a message saying that you were quite a fashionable guy. Um, in your time, even in your school uniform, you were always very neat. So, so that's some cool stuff to learn about you. Well, yeah, even as a, even as a power, I was the most powerful power. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so about a year and a half, you stayed clean. Yeah. And you went on doing what you were doing. What were you doing within that time? Were you still in, in production, in studio, doing composing and doing that, 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 that kind of work? I used that time I, to, to document my, um, my ideas, my songs that I started writing years before when I... And I just I, I use that that time to just complete all my loose ends, complete every every project that I studied, and um, I record. I, I did a, I did about three recordings of, of I, I recorded about about nine songs, original songs, and just compile them. So I just and I, I also use that time to. To, to cleanse myself, search my soul and that kind of thing. Allow my hair to grow and <laughs> bathe in the river and live like a dream. You know? Without using um, marijuana. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. so I... And then what happened? When yeah. you move, they said sometimes when you start with one, chances are you're going to move yeah. to the harder one. Yeah. What happened with him? Well, I, I got introduced to um, crack, mm. and um, do you remember yeah, how you got introduced? Of course, we are not necessarily calling anyone's name, but well, do you yeah, remember? I, I was introduced to crack by my mother. Oh. Yeah. So, um, uh, do you remember how? Do you remember what? 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 what what time it was, you know, how it happened? It wasn't anything strange, she just, she just gave it to me. And you tried it? I tried it, yeah. You liked it? Or you liked the feeling it gave yes, you? Yes, I, I, I love the feeling. Mm -hmm. Describe the feeling to me. Um, after you use crack, you, you feel well, that um, huge, Trying to present that inner 
in a peace and um, is a very peace put you in a very peaceful state and relaxed state and um it lasts only about five minutes five minutes yeah and i guess this is what why or why it is so difficult to get persons off of that drug because it it feeds you with what, how you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be relaxed, you're supposed to be peaceful, you're supposed to be in that tranquil state, naturally. And when you experience yourself like that, when someone experiences themselves like that, in that state, you, 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 you want, want to always problem. remain in right, that state. You want to remain in that state. So that's why this is more, much more difficult to get somebody off a drug that do that to you, that put you in that mood, than a drug that put you in a, an aggressive mood. So, yeah, this is what it did for me, but um, at the end of the day, the thing about this drug, it is, um, it is illegal, mm -hmm. one, for one, and mm -hmm. I, I do not, I do not see myself breaking laws and doing this kind of thing, so I, that's one of the reasons why I wouldn't partake in it anymore. Mm -hmm. um, another reason I wouldn't want to partake in it is because I don't want to be dependent on, on any substance. Um, but as to say, it didn't have a negative effect on my feeling, how it made me feel. It had a negative effect on how it made me look. And, and, and so what it made you do? do. And let's talk a bit about it. The things it made me do was mm -hmm. to do things to get money, mm -hmm. no matter what, do things to have to raise money to buy. It. So that's where we that's where we're gonna go a bit. So yeah. one, did you continue? So your mother introduced you to crack cocaine. Yeah. And did you continue smoking crack cocaine with your mother? Well, yeah, we smoked together. You all smoked together. Yeah. Smoked so together. so. Um, either you or her would have to go in search of it. Well, crack is a very selfish thing. You, every every man child have to have find the money to buy their crack. I see. So she had to find hers and you find yours. Yeah. Yes. People sell them, sell them this and share crack. Mm -hmm. Oh, so easy. I mean, how, how, one, how easy is it to get it? Or how easy was it for you to get it? And how costly was it to you? Well, I would, I would, I would, I would raise about a, on an average, raise about a hundred dollars a day. Begging? Yeah, but begging and doing carrying stuff for people, mm -hmm. to finding things to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the position mm -hmm. that it puts you in. Well, yes. Yeah. Somebody who is talented, a talented musician, a composer, someone who has mastered and created. Beautiful music, amazing music, was now walking the streets begging for money to get crack cocaine. How did you get to that movie? Let me, let me, let me, let me, um, let me read something then. As the years went by, <coughs> Literally, nothing else mattered besides feeding myself with this peaceful feeling. So it was the feeling. Right. Nothing the else. Feeling. How you how you look, how you it doesn't matter. It's feeding yourself with mm -hmm. that feeling. Mm -hmm. I asked you a question about the cost of it. The cost of it was um, and access to it. Access to it is. Did you have a, what they call it, a, a dealer, a provider, something? I mean, when you're in a in a particular circle, you mm -hmm. in a particular circle. Mm -hmm. So, it was like, like every day, mm -hmm. it was normal because I was in that circle. Mm -hmm. You know. I mean, before I, I was in that circle, I didn't know all the people that I knew that was doing that. Mm -hmm. That was selling, and I didn't know mm -hmm. because I wasn't in that mm -hmm. circle, you know. 
Um, as to the, the cost of it, um, it it costs you could the, the, the cheapest you could get crack for is five dollars, mm -hmm. and five dollars would, would allow you to get to get one smoke. So one smoke is five dollars. One smoke is five. Yeah. So one smoke, you smoke, you get your get five your five, your five minute high, your five minute, and then that. And that's it. Five for five. And how soon after that would you want another five minute high? The, the black, it has five minutes high, so when the five minutes high, you want another high, you know that? Depending on how well, you know, you, yeah, you, you just want that. You just want that. Yeah, I just wanted that because, because, okay. because of what had happened to me, you from overworking myself, there was pain in my body. I needed a, a break from that. Mm -hmm. And crack was giving me exactly that. Mm -hmm. Yet it only last five minutes but, and it was illegal. But then you turned to a street person. Yes, and yes, because... At what point did you turn mm -hmm. into a street person? Literally nothing else mattered after you experienced that after you experience that nothing else matters i don't think i can put it in any in any, other any way. other way that so it was the feeling we're coming back to the feeling that it gave you you said you it's always about the feeling it's mm -hmm. drugs it's mm -hmm. always about the feeling but yes this particular feeling this type of feeling this peaceful, tranquil feeling. This is what I needed to allow myself to heal. Were you homeless? Well, I, I, had a, I had a house, yeah, but I wasn't staying in it. I would sleep on the streets. You would literally lay down on the sidewalk? This is where I found more comfort. On the sidewalk? On the, sidewalk. On the hard concrete? Yes. When you had a home? Yeah. But wouldn't you want to at least just go home to rest? Let's say you have a bed or something. No, the, the, the house was empty. It was, it was just like sitting outside. Ah, so it was lonely. No doors, no, well, the, basically no windows. Oh, you mean the structure itself? The structure was there. I think, well, part of the roof was, was, wasn't, wasn't there. So, do you remember what it was like, you know, literally going in garbage bins, trying to get your next meal? When you would have had money, because you would have collected money, you said, you would have asked and people would have given you money, even though they knew some of them what you were going to do with it. What would you say when you ask for, what would you say, or what would you ask for the money for? Oh. Can I get them to buy something? That's it. Yeah. Whether something you were you were feeding definitely was not food. Sometimes. I seldom used to use money for 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 food for food. Money was for for the feeling. Crack. It was for the feeling. Well, yeah. Just for the feeling. <clears throat> so 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 then you know I was asking again. In your mind, mm -hmm. did you feel you were doing anything wrong when you were going in search of food in garbage? My, I have, I have no regrets. I was living the life. As I say, I was the most powerful power. Mm -hmm. I was living. That is the life I was living, and I was living that life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. So, a normal life for me, a normal that is that was a normal life. Mm -hmm. That's a normal power life. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that. There's all the power was even afraid mm -hmm. to be digging the rubbish and all this kind of thing. And I was. So you were the king of the power. My, my mother, my mother didn't even want to do that. Doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I was. You, I, you could say that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I remember seeing you a few times when we Yeah, of course I beg you. I was a beg you. And, and <laughs> but it's the look. Oh, I, I, my. You had this I look like a completely different person. Yeah, and, and, and the way you would look at people, you wouldn't say much. You still didn't say much. 
and you just look you have just have that stare or this 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 just this look on your face of 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 nothing you know you just you just you just looking looking at people yeah, nothing else matters nothing else matters yeah. Remind us again, when you read a bit of it at the beginning of the of the program, when you said about the situation where you got your fingers, so you now have three fingers on your left yeah, hand. Eight fingers. Yes, you have eight three fingers and all. <laughs> Remind us again of that story. Well, I was um, on Independent Street one night. I mean, I had maybe tap out in terms of once you see I'm in the garbage that means was a close was going to close was a lot of people again like nobody to give you yeah so I was there and I'm going to the garbage looking for something to eat I get normally do, do every night and then find a nice a, a sidewalk and say well yeah and I take it on that on that you pull it up there yeah. tonight <laughs> and indeed that plan didn't end up happening um now yeah somebody say Boy, come on in there. I check in. Why not? Leave me alone. No, not even in. I, I said no. I don't even rubbish. In a power, in a rubbish. Yeah, that you that that trouble in you. I said not to myself, boy. I check in. Not even in rubbish. I get peace of mind. So and so the person came up to me and then he pulled the bag and then my bag pulled and then threw it on onto the road. So that's why I check in. I really. Don't smoke how much I smoke. That's why I like a lamb. I'm like peaceful, 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 peaceful. peaceful. <laughs> so I go and pick up my, my bag of food and then I check in. Uh, when I check in, Mr. Lamb, you know, Mr. Rowe going in his car, get cutlass. So that was back. a normal person who was doing that to you? Yeah. Not yeah. another pal? No, 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 no. I wasn't doing those kind of things. They even find a pal. In a stressful position, there is maybe somebody they owe in or something like that, and it doesn't come behind them. But as to separate attack people, and uh, most most you don't find people that anyway. Uh, I'm not I'm not an advocate for for parole. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, the guy came came up with the cutlass. So I check him out. Oh, I'm not he. He said, "For me, so what?" So I started walking backwards, checking again away from Mr. Messer. I told I up I up to now I still cannot understand I check in, that this fellow was that serious. And and then when I reach on, on the crossroad, that's on Independent Street and Kenny Avenue, that's Kenny Avenue and then you have Independent Street. So I stopped. I was hoping that the fellow would just Back door and you leave back. you alone. Yeah, but he didn't. He, that's exactly there. He just swing the cutlass and then I don't know how my head didn't split in two mm -hmm. because that was even harder than the impact was harder than the second one that took up my fingers. Mm -hmm. And I, my thing, my fingers just go fling. It just go through like like butter. So now I I I don't know how my head didn't split in two mm -hmm. because the first the first impact was in the middle of my head. Then I'm standing there and I'm still calm and and numb. He hit me and then full blast by checking and he saved me this the side of the cutlass, not realizing he actually hit me with the sharp part of the cutlass. Yes. So moments after blood started running down, and then when I see that I start, I then start, I start clicking to me that this is a serious situation. Mm -hmm. And before I could to do anything, he, he attacked again, and then I raised my left hand, and then they will my little finger is gone, and in that, that one swipe, my little finger and my ring finger. Mm -hmm. They are gone. And I never heard about that, I'm moving. Yeah? No, I'm, I'm, I saw this for the first time tonight. Okay. In terms of, you know, the situation that you lost your fingers. Yeah, just like that. And then so I, when I assess, quickly assess the situation in my mind, and I say the only way to get out of this <laughs> was to, to run. Mm -hmm. 
to flee that area immediately. And then I run out to the shop, my channel. That is usually the last place in, in Rosa that is open. Mm -hmm. And then moments after the task force and police was making the rounds and they saw me there, all covered in blood. They asked me what happened and then I, and then I told them and they take me to, took me to the hospital and then I was cared for. Why there's a lot of people that know that um, this fella did that to me. There's a lot of people that, that I really love him. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind, I kind of see with the person because it is a, is a, a different perspective as well. You I kind mean, of see with the person. I, it's a different perspective. I mean, some people don't know how to control their emotions. Yes, but, but what you're doing is I'm not justifying. No, I'm not justifying that. It's not uh, their business. Right. <laughs> but is he had no rights. The person had no. The, by the way, did you know who it was? I knew you who it was. Yeah. There was the person never arrested? Um, well, I didn't know the person personally. Okay. But I know the person's nickname. I told the person what I knew. I told the police what I knew. Mm -hmm. And um, I did nothing. I didn't pursue it because... But it wasn't your place to pursue it. It was the place of the police well, to the pursue police it. The police did investigate and okay. stuff like that. And I guess if I wanted this to come... If I wanted them to, to deal with him... If I wanted to be part of that, I, I would. But I choose to focus on on myself rather than focus on the person that did the, the harm to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody is sending a message here and they're saying, even with all his power, even with all his power he was, Mervyn still had values. He told me he was hungry, but I had no money on me, so I invited him to accompany me to a friend's place where I would order food and pay later. He told me he would not let me credit for him. Maybe you don't remember that at all. You maybe don't remember those kinds of um, um, situations. Um, Actually, I think I do remember. You do remember that situation? Yes, yes. So you really would have said that, don't credit for me. This is this is incredible, incredible. I mean, I, yeah, I'm li I'm living my life like a candle in the wind. Yes. Why should somebody be, I mean, doing something that they have to pay back mm -hmm. at a, uh, later, a later date for you? Later, you know, mm -hmm. I think it would have been a selfish, really selfish thing. From there. You were taken to the hospital, you were cared for, yeah. you stayed about two weeks, and then what? You were released back into... Yeah, he was back, and then... And due to that, I believe the, the psychiatric um, unit had... Uh, and uh, the, the, the ward that I was on, I think they had uh, some, some arguments because they were... They were, um, they were they were vexed that the the um, what word was it? It's half a word. The, the they didn't release me to the psychiatric unit. So they were they were vexed about that, and um, maybe that's why they, they came and looked for me. So mm -hmm. about the two days later, they came and they. they they abducted me. <laughs> <laughs> they abducted you for good cause, moving For good cause. Abducted, abducted <laughs> on the streets and then. then. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, after that, then I, I, two days, I had a chance to escape. I escaped. You escaped, yeah, escaped from the hospital or the psychiatric? The psychiatric, yeah. You escaped? Yeah. It's a bit, it's a no, bit no. lax there, so... That is lax? Yes. No, and you'll be in bad in the psychiatric unit. Okay. okay. <laughs> so how did you escape? <laughs> you mean on... on um, how did you escape? On okay. Alpha Ward, you can go and come as you please. Mm -hmm. But down in the psychiatric unit, that's, that's a jail, that's a prison. <laughs> okay, so how did you escape from that prison? 
Let's just say got an opportunity to escape. <laughs> <laughs> On top of that, I escaped, and that same twenty, I had twenty dollars that my friend had given me before they helped up me, and I that I used to hide in the pew. Mm -hmm. So you should know I, I guess you're gonna go and you gonna so, for your yeah. I, mean, your I guess maybe after complete spending that twenty dollars and doing that, I guess maybe just give. I just have to give up because yeah, I just give up. Just give up. Somebody wants to know, um, we're going to continue, um, you know, to get to how you got off cooking, but somebody wants to know, what about the guys who sold you crack on the regular? Since stopping, have they attempted to try getting you back to buying their product? Well, I don't frequent the areas that they hang out. Um, these these, um, these um, dealers, they don't go and force people. And they're just they're providing just like they like they, they do your business. Mm -hmm. You want something, you buy. You haven't got money, you wouldn't get. You no credit. For credit. No credit. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. So it's not it's not something that they are, they are hustling to to get a market share or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm gonna ask you a question, Wilhelm, and you can choose to answer if you wish. If you choose not to, that's fine. What is the worst thing you did to get money for drugs? The worst thing I did. Uh, I, I, I don't have a worst. I don't have regrets. I accept that this is the life I was living and So you, you stole? Huh? You stole at times, maybe? Um I had a a, a, a situation where I did kind of steal. <laughs> you kind of steal <laughs> I did kind of steal, yeah. A, a situation where somebody gave me money to go and buy leg quarters for them. Oh no, <laughs> they did not. <laughs> yeah, so free, um, free, free pack, free um, packets of of leg quarters. So that was about ninety dollars. And that day I was owing, <laughs> owing, and um, if I owing, I mean I carry drugs to smoke. So I, I. I I use the money, I pay off my debt, and I you got some more. Some more, to, more to smoke. And eventually, I, I pay back the lady piece by piece. Okay. So I, it's kind of still, it's, though I, I kind of borrow it as well. You, you, you can't, because you paid it back? You paid it back, yeah. <laughs> okay. so, so, Marvin, you escaped from the psychiatric unit. Yeah. And you went back to get your product. What happened? After yeah. that, you just continue? No, well, I, well after I, I got up, because when I was on my way doing the project on Great George Street, mm -hmm. and I left, on my way to go and buy drugs. So after you escaped, you got a little gig? Oh, no, well, that's, that was a different. That was the, I, after I got out of the hospital, the hospital, the, the hospital, the hospital for, for my injuries, fingers. yes. Mm -hmm. I got a little gig, a little okay. um, project to do to mm -hmm. strip off some paint mm -hmm. of, of Margot's house, the front of her house, because she was going to paint, she was going to paint it. And um, I was tired, so I decided I would take a little smooth, take a little chill out, and then come back and, and complete that. But when I reached on Independent Street, Brendan um, gave me twenty dollars. So I, I check in, I say to myself. Twenty-five dollars worth of drugs, less than that. That project couldn't see me, so I, I changed my mind. What am I doing? So you, you, your mind was still there. Well, yes, my, yes, most, most. People. Because you made a decision there. Do I go and smoke and lose my job that I'm going to get paid for, or do I go back and finish my job and get my money? Was that a decision that you had to make that day? Well, yes, go finish the job as well. Then, I, when I get paid, I can smoke more than twenty-five dollars worth of mm. drugs. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I'd, I'd, you're what, feeding a habit really, really well, bad. Well, yes, but it it, it worked. It works in two ways because I'm saying if I go now and smoke twenty-five dollars worth of drugs, mm -hmm. I wouldn't go back and do the project. Mm -hmm. There's no way I'm going to not go into sleep. Today, mm -hmm. except 
when that $25 I go, I was not going to do it in night. <laughs> and ask for an advance. But I, I would be guilt. I would feel guilty because mm -hmm. I didn't come and finish. So you it. had a conscience. Of course. Yeah, I had a conscience. Anyway, so when I was on my way back, I, I get the twenty dollars, and I already I already had the five dollars in my pocket. So I I changed my mind. I started walking back. So I had that very crossroad by Burton and Company and Jay's Bookstore. Yeah. Bam. Psychiatric unit boss. Murray, Murray, why we there looking for you? My chicken. Let's go, let's go, let's go. I'm checking to myself, boy, I have a project to the cat, the cat away from the cow. The cow, anyway, I have to come. Hold me and put me in the bus. Let's go, let's go. Up the road. Psychiatric unit. Right. And when I, I fight with all my strength to get out of that. I just couldn't because it burned me so much to know that I had that twenty five dollars there. I was gonna smoke, <laughs> and right at that time, <laughs> the bills just come and blow my eye. <laughs> literally blow your eye. Oh my god! You were not very happy about that. I, that just made me crumble. I guess maybe all that's why I just give up on that. Damn, that much for my language. Give up on that, on that bloody. On that bloody drugs mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So they took you to to, to psychiatric units. Yeah. So uh -huh. two days after I escaped. You escaped two days after. That's when yeah. you escaped. Yeah. <laughs> two days after I escaped. That twenty dollars I threw in there. I smoked that, and then, and then when I went to the hospital to to, to take care of my dressing, my dressing mm -hmm. they, they hold you. They hold me again, and then. You just gave up. I just gave up. I said, yeah, that, yeah, that's it. That must, have, that must mm -hmm. be the end. That, mm -hmm. that has to be the end. Mm -hmm. I just gave up and allowed the um, process of change to happen. So and I, is that where it started, maybe? Well, yes. That's where it started. But that's how, that's how people stop using drugs, mm -hmm. by actually believing that they want a change. Mm -hmm. They want a better thing for themselves. Mm -hmm. Unless you don't believe that, that's it. And, and, and we'll talk some more about the change and where it has led us to today. But in terms of the mental element of it, what did it do to you? Um, what happened to your I mind? Really, well, marijuana, uh, I was always... Marijuana would mess me up clean. Mm -hmm. Mess me up to the point where I would always be questioning things, always in Bible and... <laughs> You know, they, they can't see this, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah. What about the cocaine? I would maybe turn into a philosopher and, and just... And just start speaking and, and saying kind of things. things. So, you know, that wasn't me. But the, the crack, well, it's, it's just normal. I just... Opposite calm, effect. Just, Opposite calm as a, calm as a, as a cucumber, they say. Mm -hmm. Cool as cool a as cucumber. Cool as a cucumber, yeah. yeah. The change began. Mm. Psychiatric unit. Talk us through the process. Um. Well, I found out later that um, while I was there at the hospital, I was I was really wondering why does everybody spending two weeks a month, but why they wasn't letting me go. Only to find out my relatives abroad have told them to not let me go because we are sending somebody down to to coordinate that rehabilitation thing. Mm -hmm. And then yeah, a point person was yeah, needed. Right, and then yeah, so I was in there for right forever. I was in that place forever. <laughs> And um, yeah, I, I just let go. I mean, whatever I had to do, I would do. I and mean, I just start accepting more and more that I, 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 I want a more positive image of moving, and started building that, 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 and and 
as time go by, I became stronger to, in terms of my resistance to be able to resist that that um, that drug called crack. So, so yeah. How, how long did how did how long did your rehabilitation process take? I was in I was in um rehab uh, see but. When did my is Maria? Mm -hmm. Maria twenty seventeen September. In September. Mm -hmm. So I was in I was in there from maybe about August. Because Maria I was in, in the hospital. At the psychiatric unit. Yeah. So I can go God bless, I was mm -hmm. in the hospital maybe. Mm -hmm. I would be one of those missing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then God working, maybe. Uh, it wasn't at, your time. At the crossroads. Yes. <laughs> it wasn't your time. Yeah. So, so from that time to until when do you recall until when? From yeah, to 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 um all the way up to January. Yeah. I was at the hospital because mm -hmm. I went to rehab. I went to Saint Lucia rehab for for one month. For one month. Yeah, and then on my way back, when I came back, I immediately immediately like I came back on the on the on Friday or the Saturday. On the way on the Friday. Mm -hmm. So I got my cousin um, organized me with her, an apartment. She yes. organized me with um, with um, the money, disposable cash, just make my life more comfortable. Where uh, to point where I don't have, don't have any stress. Mm -hmm. So, and then Monday from Monday, so I came in on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I get. I get familiar with my, my apartment at, at Lugia. Monday, I was supposed to have to go to a job that um, fixed three meals, who would not island ice cream. Yeah. Also, a friend and a band member. Band member. He decided to give me a job. And um, I didn't go to the job on Monday. I ended up going my Davos and just, just chill my Davos. So, <laughs> When uh, my my cousin called from the states, and she 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 asked if uh, all the job go. Good <laughs> answer. I tell her I didn't go. And I didn't go. I will go. I will go next day. next day. And so I'm going to use she said she just getting all at me for um, you end up going my dad and pull up my dad goes. And do nothing with the answer. Anyway, I say okay, okay, I'll go next day because there wasn't a particular time to say I was supposed to go because mm -hmm. they say picture basically say uh, yeah, give me your job when you're ready, you check me. Okay. You check. So I guess she assumed that well, seeing that I come on Friday, I guess Monday is the next working day, then I will just go. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so on Tuesday I went to the job and then they started working working there. I worked there for uh, for two years until COVID hit, and then I got laid off. So I was home for a while, and then um, my perfect um, support system again. They um, things in place to make sure that I am well taken care of. I was another job was um, assigned to me, and I was. At Rubens Bakery, so I was asked to come in and um, fill out the application, and then so I did, and then um, a while after I got a call, and now I'm currently at Rubens Bakery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I like this company. You've adjusted. You've yeah. adjusted well. Yes. How has it been staying clean? Has it been a challenge? Has it been easy? How has it been? Well, I, 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 I got cravings to smoke about, since I've been clear, I got cravings about twice. Twice? About twice. What but, do you do moving Well, the first time I got the craving, I, I called my my cousin in the States and then, hey, yeah, yeah, I got a craving and stuff like that. So I we spoke for a while and then the second time I just, I just blew it off. You brushed it off. <laughs> That, that's real power. That's I, real power. Uh, it starts with actually believing. 
you want to change. So. Yes, yes. And that has been it, Marvin. Yeah, yeah. You've had you've had cravings twice. Yeah, yeah. And and was that in recent times or earlier I on? Mean, earlier in 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 um in um, but but the thing about I mean gold balance. I know the 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 dangers. Not not just dangers, but I know the the real estate that comes with smoking crack. You cannot smoke crack in secret. <laughs> it's not something you go in and say, well, I'm going to smoke crack today, and then maybe. I'll be a, so, a, a social crack smoker. It, that, is not, that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That you, doesn't exist. No, mm -hmm. You're all in. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, because of how expensive it is, you have to find money to supply it. And most likely, you will find yourself in rags. Mm -hmm. You don't want that again. That, that is part of the, the real estate crack that comes with that. So, I mean, Knowing all these things, I mean, for me to put, for me to use this again, these are the things that have to be considered. Do I want to be, to mm -hmm. have that big real estate? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do, do I you, want to be responsible? Do you want to put your life at risk? You almost lost your life. Well, yes. You know? Somebody t says to me, I'm touched by moving story. Heard about his issue very late. I salute him for his courage. Let me know, let him know I would like to make a contribution to him through you. Person doesn't want me to mention the name on the radio, but I'll tell you who it is afterwards. Um, so that person there just saying they would like to make a contribution to you. So um, once they do that, I will get your contribution to you. And, and at this point, I mean, Mervyn is not here to beg or anything like that. He mm -hmm. has gotten a job, he's working. But if someone wants to contribute to his well-being and to ensure that he stays on the right, you know, um, if you have the extra and you want to do that, it's all good. Right, Mervyn? Well, yeah, definitely. You will welcome it. I am gradually um, investing in um, building a new studio, right? So piece by piece, piece by piece, I am putting together to buy bits and pieces so that I can have something that I can continue um, composing music. How involved are you in music right now? Well, at this at this level, I, 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 right now I, I only have a computer, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I have a computer, so I, I do what I do, I do what I can with mm -hmm. it. And um, have yeah, you have you done anything do in recent times? I've been doing. I I, I did uh, writing. I do some writing. Um, I composed three songs for Ophelia. Maybe hopefully I'll finish them for. I will punish them by um, by the end of this month, so I can give it, give them to her. These are songs that I say I would I would do for because when I was um, when I was on the streets, she asked me to write some songs for her, and I said okay. <laughs> I'm only now getting about to doing it. You're yeah, only now. Yeah. So you're getting back into the groove of things. Yeah, yes, yes, and this yes. is excellent. And I think everybody listening to the program right now must be smiling to hear you <laughs> say that. Um, because we want to see you get back into that. Not to the point where it frustrates you though. So mm -hmm. know when to, um, remember that's what happened to you at the beginning. Yes. You were feeling closed up in a room. Um, you were beginning to get frustrated and all of that. And so um, pace yourself. Take your time. When you recognize that you need a break, take a break. Take a break. Take a break. Do not allow it to consume you. I know that you love it. Um, you love the music very much. But also remember what happened. Yes. And, 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 and how it contributed to what happened to you. Brilliant. But at the same time, it's your first love. And so I think it's a matter of balance. Um, you just have to learn to balance you know, your music and when you need to take a break from it and when you need to do other things. Right. And yeah. once you are able to manage that and balance it all, then um, you should be able uh, to be fine. So Daryl, you can touch base with us now. Um, I just want Daryl to call 
Um, direct call us on 449-3095. Let's have a quick chat with you as one of the persons, you know, who was closest to Mervyn and who also stood by him um, through thick and thin. And, you know, I remember you all did a concert, you know, there was, I think, something at Creole in the Park that we, we, we bound together to try to, um, to assist Mervyn. I know that there are many people who tried to assist him. You must be proud today of where he is. And um, Mervyn is the true representation of recovery and of hope. And the next person I'm hoping that can happen for is my good friend, Franklin Moses. Let's take this call. Let's see if it's Daryl on the line. Good evening. Hello? Hello, good evening. Yes, I can hear you, Daryl. Go ahead. Okay, all right. Uh, good night, good night, good night. Good night to you. Good night, good you. Yeah, good night. What's up, Greg? I want to, to share with the, on this program is that Lumin is a very modest individual, Sadana. Very, very modest. I, I listened and I felt that Lumin left so many important things in his life because of the, the modest individual that he is. Uh, yes, you spoke about the Christmas album, but Lumin has had many more achievements than just the Christmas album. You know, Lumin. Deserves right now, Mobi deserves a golden drum award. I've been good extensively with, with guys like Hunter in, in the area of Hunter when Hunter won crowns and, and Crunter the Brother the Brothers. Mobi was instrumental in creating music for his people. Um, also, I don't know, you know the theme song for the police, um, the police show on the beat. Mobi created that, that, as a matter of fact, Mobi is the one with the top of vocals in that song, that, that was stripped from all that is intellectual property. Um, and, and also my first song, like I said myself, in my first song I started the competition in 2001, and something is wrong, but it was the one who actually composed the music for that song. So I just want to, I want to just put this thing out there that he is a great individual. I, I don't know if I missed that part because I was rushing home when you started to that. Um, Louisville did not, I did not hear where he spoke that he was, he had a wife, you know, he, he was a married, a married man, a complete man, <laughs> and I didn't hear that. He may have, maybe, maybe it was said, I don't know, but I just want to add this on here that he was, he was, he was married with his, his enterprise at home, his studio, and everything was pretty nice for him. Um, so at this point, now that I've said that he was a married man, I also I want to say that I was not the only one who participated in Mervyn's recovery. And I, I want to reach out to his, his, his beautiful his beautiful wife, Ben. They are now divorced. That's um, Lydia Wright. They're sort of us there. Okay, and um, and also Fitzroy Mills, who employed him as Mervyn said, keep him off the street. I also want to say a um, special thanks to um, his former girlfriend, Eleanor Powers, and his beautiful daughter, Brianna. But they also didn't say that, I, I, didn't, I don't recall him saying that he was like, the father of two beautiful children, uh, a big boy and a big girl. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, I want to say, I, I just want to reach out to these people who were very instrumental in his development, and um, Daniela, Edwina, Clayton Hazel, who is listening in from Cairo. Aileen, his cousin, who lives in Florida, I believe. Um, Billy Doctor, if I want to think about Billy Doctor, Billy Doctor was one of the citizens who called me and said, you know, Bob, I will move in and I, I want to do something for him. I want to help you to do something. And Billy actually put his money forward so that we could record songs, create an album to raise funds for him and so on. And, um, well, that, that, was, that, because that was supposed to be a team effort, that actually went on hold. And um, he didn't kind of forgive us for that, but that is a first, that is a pending project for Mervyn. Also, Dr. Benjamin, who, um, who assisted with getting Mervyn into the rehab in St. Lucia. So there, there's so many things, but I don't want to, I don't want to cloud, cloud up your, your show with all that. Well, no, no, I think it's quite relevant, um, Daryl. I think the information that you're sharing with us is quite important because, like you said, 
he is quite a modest guy because I did ask him a couple of times, you know, what are some of the contributions that you made to the band and so on. And, you know, he, he limited the information that he shared. So we're really grateful and thankful for that, Daryl. Yeah, I, I, he, he, he was the main originator of the band at the time because, you know, when we started re really recording you after you, he was the one, he was the only one who actually learned the keyboard, you know, professionally and, and, and delivered. So I, I am very happy that, you know, Moving has recovered, he's made a full recovery. And I also want to say to the society that people like that, we have to continue to be in our brother's keeper. We always have to encourage them. We have to be friendly with them. We have to understand that their stories can happen in our own lives and in our own families as well. And that is the that is the beacon of light I see those they carry. You know? So I to be Moving is one of my greatest my greatest my degree, one of the greatest things that has ever happened to me is seeing his life, the mistakes that he has made, and I was just lucky that I might have to make them as well. So the lessons in that designer for me, before I go, I just want to say there are some very important lessons that I think others should should um, um, pass them on. And one of them is arguments. Arguments are very healthy. healthy. Early on in the show, Bobin said that he and Darren Bob never had an argument. And that is very, very true. And I, I beat myself every day that it happened that way because if we had argued, if we if we had thought about things that we didn't agree on, um, I don't think Louis would have gone through that predicament in his life. So I blame myself. So arguments are very healthy. As long as we can respect each other, we can agree to disagree. Let us argue, let us fight on a point to the bone. And and that is some of in my relationship with Louis because so they were And I say this boldly, Mobile is no longer my best friend. I will not go back to being his best friend. Mobile is now a permanent fixture in my life. We are past this stage of best friends. You know, he is he's way beyond my even my brother. He's my he's my responsibility for the rest of my life. Best friend is just a joke. And 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 imagine he's still there with his limitation and he's still able to, to play music with me and everything. And I, I thank God so much for that, you know, because we, we were able to do some successful Christmas shows online and everything. And we look forward to doing more than that. And, you know, marijuana is not healthy for every individual. It is a very powerful substance, and not every human being can sustain the power of marijuana. And we need to understand those things. And I, I want to assume some responsibility for those temporary is mine because I did not fight with him about it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is this is this is my this is also part of my life story, you know. Saddens me that you know, but it's a bittersweet moment right now. But I just want to I want to thank everybody who has participated in his recovery. And I know I just want to say to you to so know that the whole world is listening, my brother, that I love you and I, I can never stop loving you. Thank you, Dario. I can understand why you would definitely get um, emotional, you know, sharing what you've shared. And um, I'm happy that you called to share what you shared with us um, because Mervyn didn't share some of it. So um, I knew you were married, though, Mervyn. You know, okay. I knew you were married at, at one point in time. I knew who your ex wife um, is as well. And um, somebody mentioned that you have two children. Well, I had two children, but I actually raised 13 children. We were like, my wife and I were like, we were like, um, like Mother Teresa. Um, the, um, all, my house was always, was always filled with blood. Wow. I, we, had, we had um my cousin in St. Thomas, he had like, three, three of his children. Three of them came down to, to live with us for a while. We had uh, my wife, three sisters, four sisters, one, two, four sisters. We had um, my sister who was living at the back. She had two boys. Mm -hmm. And we had, um, I had two, I am Brianna Bowers, their son, and also Kian Mackenzie, their son. Brianna um, is in, lives in Canada, she's Canadian, and um, Kian is in. Um, is in Los, in Los Angeles or Cali is in California. So um yeah my, my house was always full of always that full of children. I was Are you children. hoping for that again, Marvin? Have you found love again? 
Are you hoping to find love again? Actually, my, I'm living, I'm living a, a, a life of celibacy right now. Okay. I'm, I am single. I, okay. I, I only go from work to home, supermarket. Mm -hmm. home. And that's fine. And that's yeah, fine. That's, 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 what, that's what I'm living right now. Um, as to me finding, um, I just say love, finding love. Yes, yes. Well, um, I, I, I haven't given it much thought. Actually, I haven't. You're living in the moment for now. You've decided how you want your, how you want to live your life for now, and that is what you want. Well, um, yeah, you satisfy just... yourself. You please yourself. Probably a year from now, you might say, you know what. I probably need some companionship. Well, it's just true, you but know? even with having a companion, I would be pleasing, pleasing myself because mm -hmm. I am with someone I want to, to be, be with. with. Correct. You know, so um, I just, I I guess I am just like I I see myself like a baby mm -hmm. that is just You're growing again. Growing again. Yes. Honestly, again. I mean. I don't, I don't see myself, I can't picture or envision myself mm -hmm. on a date because I feel like I'm not big enough to be on a date. I understand. <laughs> I understand it's, it's, like, it, it's like you're experiencing a rebirth. I would be exactly. And, yeah. and, and it will take some time as you go through each stage again of life. Yes. What are the lessons learned from your experiences moving? Well, um, just just quite a bit of them, but um, in my in my situation, I would say that I allow my my passion to to consume me, whereas my passion was supposed to be something that accommodates my, myself, me. My passion was supposed to accommodate me, not me, my physical self accommodating my passion and this is what I did I allow my physical self to always feed my passion whereas the thing that I love was supposed to accommodate me and allow me to be comfortable within myself what should we learn from your experience don't allow your passion to consume you. The things that you love always find the balance between all extremes and from there you be true to yourself and you let your heart be your guide. That is basically how I live. Mm -hmm. How do you think your experience can help persons like Franklin Moses for example and others like him who are still on the streets? dealing with what they're dealing with? Well, from a, a, a personal perspective, it is quite easy to, to, stop, to stop using. The difficult part is finding what you really want for yourself. And most likely, this is what he want for himself and it, at at present. Do you believe so? Well, the moment a human being say that they want something and they really want something and truly believe they want something, they will get they get it. Especially when it's something to do with themselves and something that they have the power to change or to do to achieve. Mm -hmm. You believe so? Yes. Okay. Wow, so much so much has has, has been shared. Um, within this time that you've been on the program, Mervyn. A young person who is listening to the program now, 14 years, mm -hmm. 15 years, at that sensitive stage in life where they can make the kinds of mistakes that you made, what can you say to them? Even thinking about taking a puff, or just saying you're going to try crap. 
because that's what you did. You took one bath one time, and then another time, your mom gave you mm -hmm. the, the, the crack cocaine. Teenager you were, yeah. very young. Your mind, still very young. There's, a, there's, there's many young people out there now who will be thinking about it or who have maybe even started smoking the marijuana. They've not probably yet moved to the next level. I want you to speak to them, Marie. Based on your own personal experiences, talk to them. I would say um, we are part of a society and there are rules and regulations that are put, are put in place to allow us to to be better people and to to strive for a better quality of life. And we shouldn't take what the, our laws for granted. Mm -hmm. Laws are put in place to allow us and to protect us and to allow us to to achieve a better quality of life. And Breaking the law isn't something that anybody should practice, especially somebody that is on the age of also. That is where I would put it. Do not break the law. Do not break the law. Do not break the law. And, and, and that will protect you from everything else. Yes. Moving down so we have to wrap things up on the program. Somebody wanted to know as well, in terms of royalties, do you get royalties for your music? I don't get not a cent. You don't get not a cent? Not a cent. Okay. Is that something that is being looked into? Is that... Well, the music industry is set up in, in such a selfish way that it, is, it makes it difficult for small islands to, to reap the benefits. For instance, if I am in the United States, I can join a, 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 a company, or what do you call it, a, a royalty company. Mm -hmm. I could be part of that and receive money. But if I live out of the United States, there is no, no company that represents Dominica St. Lucia. We have no representation in, in terms of... But isn't there an echo or something? The echo is, is a facade. Honestly. Mm -hmm. um, is, uh, there's nothing. Okay. In so you've, reality, not been, nothing. you've not been getting, you've not been getting any comments. All right. Um, we're wrapping things up. Moving. Yes. I'm going to give you the final opportunity. Um, give your final comments and I know we already spoke just briefly about what life is right now but where do we go from here you mentioned your studio and where do we see moving in the next five to ten years most likely um, it is possible that moving might launch itself as a solo artist okay. and do his thing have his band have his what kind his of solo what kind of music well, that's the thing, you know. It would have to be things that issue, that deal with issues of the heart. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it would have to have something that would that would catch the interest and draw the interest of persons that are every and everywhere, anywhere. Mm -hmm. So it would have to have some some kind of familiar bit that would introduce that, that presence of happiness mm -hmm. despite if the lyrics might speak about heartbreak or mm -hmm. it would have, it would be something that would be accepted by a wide audience we look forward to that moment yes. Yes. so share your final comment with us your final words as we wrap it up well I I realize that there are a lot of people that love moving there. So <laughs> I 
we realize that I have a lot of fans. I am dumbfounded. <laughs> I am just blown away by all this love and continue feeling more love. Right. Yes. How does that make you feel? It makes, me, it makes me feel like moving. It makes you feel like moving. That is moving. That is yeah. important. <laughs> Mervyn, let me say first of all, thank you again to e Echo 48, is it? Yes, Echo 78 or Echo 48? Echo 78, I think it is. So let me just say thank you to you guys um, for reaching out. And I do sincerely appreciate that. Mervyn, you are an awesome guest. And we do indeed love you dearly. And we want to see you to continue to be the moving that you want to be. And that we're looking forward to your music whenever you produce your own music. We're looking forward to seeing you with a smile on your face. We are looking forward to seeing you as a happy individual. Um, but most importantly, we look forward to hearing more of you sharing your story with others so that they can be inspired. You may be able to save a couple of souls, you can motivate others. And you can just be a source of inspiration because you've been that tonight. And we thank you for being brave to coming for coming here and sharing your story with us on the In the Spotlight Radio Show. We pray God's blessings upon you because these are the kinds of messages that I'm getting on your behalf here tonight. And I'm sure throughout the program, live on, on Facebook as well. And we, we continue to wish you well. And we hope that you never crave any type of drug again we pray that you never relapse and that you just continue to shine bright and you just continue to do well and be the amazing humble person that you are thank you thank you and, and good night good night all right That is a wrap on the In the Spotlight radio show for tonight. The return program, I think that was an awesome guest for the return of our program. And we thank him sincerely. And um, God willing, we're going to be back here um, next week. Remember, guys, to um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's for Diana F. Frampton. I forgot to mention that at the beginning. Remember to join our, 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 our um, In the Spotlight radio show group. Follow our pages, you know, like us, support us. Um, we do thank you very much for your support. 